sometimes the only power you have is saying no. And then eventually, hopefully you have the power of saying yes. But I've known it was going to be a huge pivot and a huge overhaul to shift this. And I just fucking pray that Dead Ringers at least starts that path forward of like, oh, interesting. She's kind of different and she has all of her clothes on. (laughs) Look at that. And, you know, even if it's on overnight shift, I hope at least somebody sees that and is introduced to a new piece of me and maybe gives me a chance. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Emily Mead is an actor. She sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. Is there a typical way that you like to begin your preparation process when you get a new character? Right off the bat, I'll start with some pretentious, (laughs) pretentious answers. But um, I'd say the first step for me is, is sort of just sort of intuiting what comes to me when I read it. Um, You know, I did go to acting school it was acting high school but you know we we learned all the different methods of acting and there's definitely little bits and pieces i've used from that um but ultimately the first step is sort of just a a natural intuition and if i don't have that for a character that definitely off the bat you know makes me less excited about it um usually i'd say my intuition is based on some sort of combination of myself and my own experiences and people I've met and sort of absor- absorbed along the way. Um, and so, especially if I'm struggling with just the automatic flow of intuition, I usually start to then piece together. You know, the other day I was, I read something that I had to audition for and it was the description and the type of character wasn't something I actually was automatically familiar with and understanding. And I spoke to somebody about this character and it turns out there's this whole, uh, basically the character is somebody who is, was described as a hippie and right wing, uh, extreme right wing. And I didn't quite understand what that meant. And after talking to my friend about this, I realized that there's this whole section of humans in this world that are, you know, they go so left that it almost becomes right. right. And I had to, sort of break this down with them and eventually I found examples in my own life and in my own observations of people that sort of fit that for me so sometimes it's just the intuition and then sometimes it's the discussing of the psychology and sociology surrounding these characters and then that's the way in but I kind I think I always have to connect it to some combination of of people I've experienced if I can't find examples or or firsthand experience even if it's from you know watching a film or a documentary Mm -hmm. um then I'm I I struggle but usually I can find that usually once I break down the psychology of somebody I can apply it to other things even if it's not an exact one-to-one and tell me why you think that is that you need to have it be somebody that you either know or that you have seen, like you're saying that you can connect with. What what do you think that is? It's not. It doesn't sound like it's about mimicking it. It's a, it's about something else, right? It's, it's it's. I think it's the only way I can understand, and I think yeah, I wouldn't say I'm someone going around mimicking people, but you know, I think my my initial desire to act came mostly from really being fascinated by people Mm -hmm. absorbing them you know i was the kind of kid who one of my dad's favorite stories i mean favorite and saddest stories was uh there was this one time where he was feeling really sad and i was about two or three years old and he was feeling really sad but he wasn't showing that he wasn't expressing that and i randomly started crying and my mom asked me why I was crying. And I said, Daddy's so sad. And he said it was this really freaky moment of like, holy shit, this little creature is, feels me no matter what. And so I hate calling myself an empath because obviously everybody overuses empath and gaslighting and narcissists these days. But I definitely am very sensitive to and very overcome by people's feelings and 
you know, again, when I was a kid, I would see people on the subway and they looked sad to me and I would be sad all day. So I think how I've dealt with that in my life is turning it into being a sort of a detective and trying to understand people and trying to, uh, you know, almost have a way of detaching from how much it overwhelms me to feel them by thinking about them instead. So I think that's what brought me to loving acting. I also, you know, grew up loving movies. So I'd say it's a combination. That's just always been my via to to it. So it's not necessarily a choice as much as like that's that's how I found the ability to perform in the first place was feeling a person and then that kind of coming out of me. When you think of people that you have worked with that you consider to be good actors that you got to know, are they all empathetic in the way you're talking about? I would say so. I mean, I think there's two different types of actors. There's technically proficient actors who, whether it's, it is a form of mimicking or studying, you know, a lot of the time people ask me like, how did you, how did you research for this character? I will occasionally research just to, again, get the like lay of the land of the the characteristics I have to bring together, you know, whether it's like what accent they have or what time period it is or, you know, little details. But ultimately, research is sort of the, the least of it for me. And obviously, there are very technically proficient actors that in my life, I've never really felt much from. Um, I can be impressed and watch them and be impressed but i'm not necessarily moved yeah and i think those are you know sort of technicians who are really really skilled and have skills i don't have and then i think there are yeah the sort of sensitive empaths who feel humans and you're less watching them construct a really technically proficient performance and you're more watching them go through something and have some sort of catharsis and bring maybe a piece of themselves out and in a, in a different form. And I think I'm more one of those actors. And so, yes, I would say the actors I've met who I find moving, not necessarily whether it's talented or not, but moving those people, yes, tend to be very curious and empathic and sensitive. And I'd say anyone I've met that has a a, more of a guard or a feeling of disconnect, they could be a very technically proficient actor, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to feel the same thing from their performance. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm exaggerating, and I'm really not. Me and my wife went back to watch The Leftovers again recently. Mm -hmm. And we were getting through the first season. And I was this time really impressed by your performance. And I was thinking about you when your people reached out to me. Oh, wow. And I told them, like, I sent this big long email that they must have been a little freaked out by or I thought this guy's weird. (laughs) I was like, I was literally thinking about her. But what do you think? I mean, this was 10 years ago now, that show, I guess, right? Or maybe just below 10 yeah. years. Uh, uh, yeah. You were still very young, but you had been acting since you were 16. Mm-hmm. So just look back on yourself then and what you know now and talk to me about how much you had a handle on your own craft then. It's funny because I think The Leftovers is always something I have mixed feelings on as far as my own performance or acting because you know, it wasn't something that I felt like I got to spread my wings and fly as much as I would have liked to. And I felt like I, you know, I, I'm somebody who played teenagers until I was 26 years old. So there was a lot of me having to sort of cut off certain wisdoms or experiences that lived inside of me, you know, and leftovers, I was either 24, 25 playing 16. So there was clearly things I had been through in my life and stages of life that, I couldn't bring to the table. Having those limitations can be unsatisfying. And that's something I've dealt with a lot in my career because I've, I've, I haven't gotten to play my own age much. So at this point, I'm 34. I've certainly never played close to a 34 year old yet. I mean, I've aged up, you know, maybe into late 20s, maybe 30. 
So at the time, there was definitely frustration around that. But as far as my skill set, I would say that The Leftovers was probably the first time that I truly had to just be present and develop my performance as it went because it was the first time I was a series regular on a show, which means I didn't know what I was going to be acting before it before I signed on to it. So everything up until that point, I did do one film at 18, I mean, at 16, but really I didn't start till I was 18. And everything I had done at that point, I had read the script, auditioned, knew the beginning, middle and end of what that performance was going to be. And I think I was still bringing in a lot of my high school experience. You know, when you're in drama school at 16, I was playing the nun character in Doubt. And I think so much of acting when you're in acting school and you're younger is seeing just how far away you can get from yourself. And that's the like impressive skill set that you're trying right. to show every like, look at me, I'm 16, but I can play this old nun. And I think that was something I brought into a lot of care. You know, I always wanted to do an accent. I always wanted to completely transform myself. And I think The Leftovers was probably the first time that I started to draw upon pieces of myself more and it wasn't that that character was exactly me but I sort of had no choice but to lean into things that already existed inside of me because I didn't even know where the character was going so I think before that there was a lot more you know pre-preparing and rehearsing in the mirror and deciding I wanted to make this face at this moment and I think with the leftovers it was the first time I had to just react to what was happening and sort of listen and respond and be more present ultimately. And I didn't have the room to completely go distance myself from myself. So I think at the time that was perhaps why it was less interesting to me Mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't getting to do some exciting transformation, but looking back there probably, it probably is the first time that I was, when, like I said, experiencing something versus trying to mimic and create this faraway performance. So I do think that was probably a turning point and a pivot in mm. the way I acted, because I think that I've completely changed what I find impressive from the time I was a teenager till now. Mm-hmm. When I was younger, I think I did find the technically proficient people transforming more impressive. And now I think I find people who can have a through line of themselves Mm -hmm. and a vulnerability more impressive. So I think The Leftovers was probably the first time I started transitioning into that. And what do you account for that kind of transition toward that kind of thinking? Was it just your work or was it what you were seeing uh, and just growing up? I think it was growing up mostly. I think it was a mixture of growing up and not having a choice because that character was not super far away from myself or at least a version of myself when I was younger. And again, I didn't have control over knowing what the beginning, middle and end. So I I couldn't go in fully prepared. So I think it was a mixture of a choice and yeah, growing up and, uh, you know, probably becoming more of myself and going deeper into myself and therefore having more of myself to offer. I mean, I think a lot of that is probably bravery and maturity to, it's funny. I think I heard somewhere that people said that some people act to, you know, have a catharsis for a piece of themselves and some people act to get away from themselves and become somebody else. And I think, you know, when I was younger and an unhappy teenager, I was probably trying to get away from myself more. And I think around 24 or 25, I was probably starting to have the bravery to try to work through things in myself and have a catharsis and show pieces of myself versus hide pieces of myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was ultimately growing up. Would you say that playing Laurie on the deuce was the first time you were actually doing a combination of using your own experiences to enhance your performance and also playing somebody that was completely not like you? Absolutely. Yes. That was a really good example of that, of, you know, there was, and I guess that's, you know, the form of acting that would be is as if, you know, playing as if, but I think, you know, the way I prepared for that character was, like I said, a a, sort of a combination of examining the psychology, examining the context of this character 
and you know pulling from people in life and and combining that but also pulling you know it's more emotional versus character traits so the character traits the little midwestern accent or whatever it is that's coming from observation of the world but when it comes to the actual feelings she's dealing with whether it's a desire to be famous it is which is what a desire to be loved and seen um having you know clearly some sort of sexual trauma that is driving a lot of her behavior relate to that having um having a certainly a self-sabotaging quality i think something that was really important to me about Lori was her to not be the hooker with a heart of gold and not be this sort of just lost victim, which I think that evolved a lot over time between the way I was performing it and therefore David Simon and George Pelicanos writing to that. Mm. But I did not want her to be a victim of anything really. I mean, she was obviously a victim of many things and a product of her environment, but she was also a victim of herself because to me, Lori had a lot of opportunities to set herself free and she didn't. I think there was a large piece of her that wanted to self-sabotage and had a lot of ego and a lot of drive to be famous versus loved and admired versus loved and that she got in her own way with that and so I I think that there's you know pieces of myself that certainly when I was younger related to that and so when I was dealing with the actual emotions she was dealing with even if the context was different the the feelings were similar and then I take that and then I sort of dress it and surround it in character traits uh that are not necessarily from me so it's you know sort of a marriage of internal the internal world and the external world and how she feels and how she presents and how she feels is from me and how she presents is from my observations of people in life how do you make all of these ingredients taste good to the audience without us pulling each ingredient apart? You make it taste good by not trying to make it taste good, I guess. I don't, yeah, you know, not to, it. yeah, not to be obnoxious and pretentious again, but it's not that hard for me and that sounds really obnoxious but I don't really necessarily think that's about anything other than some people are actors <laughs> and some people aren't I think it I think it is that black and white in certain ways and and some people are painters I certainly am not and I don't you know I think you can learn things and develop a skill set but ultimately I think you're kind of, I don't know, born that way or not. It sounds really obnoxious, but I think you are. So for me, you know, the things that are difficult is trying to make writing or certain elements that are more foreign to me make sense and feel real. But when once I've found what feels real to me and what I relate to uh, and find the voice and find the stance of a character, it is kind of easy. And so... And I don't care if people like my characters and maybe that's part of what mm. helps me. Like I, I like playing flawed characters and characters that are, can, are a little bit an asshole and not fully pure and likable. And so maybe that helps me because I know a lot of people respond to my characters in a way that they like them. Uh, and that's kind of accidental. So maybe that, you know, that's how it works when you're not trying, you know, it's like, Things happen when you least expect it, or you know, you thing you, you if you don't want something, it wants you, or whatever. So I think me not caring about whether the character is likable or not perhaps makes it more likable. Talk to me about Dead Ringers. This show, and you know, I'm not allowed to even talk about it yet. I read this long list of things because <laughs> there's so many things that you can ruin oh, in this it. show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. um, there is a large uh, set of people out there, audience that are gonna really love this thing. And then there's mm -hmm. gonna be people that are gonna be a little bit freaked out by this thing. Oh, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I hope it gets banned in, in the South right <laughs> one day. I'm hoping for that level of controversy, yeah. But talk to me <laughs> about your character, which is, you know, it, it there's a, a lot of things aren't answered in the, which, which I appreciate in this, a lot of different relationships, a lot of different things in this are not quite clear, you know, but tell me about who you play. I play Susan and I 
love this character. It was the first time I got to play someone like this. And this is after a long string of playing sort of tragically sexualized people. And Susan was so different in a way that I was really holding out for. Um, She is bizarre. (laughs) She's like a child trapped in an adult's body and you don't know if she's good or bad or cute or creepy or complicit or innocent. And I think she's a little bit of all of those things. And I think she's another example of a character that I don't mind bringing a little bit of the unlikability to her, but she is sort of likable in the way that she's so freaky and odd. (laughs) Um, But so she's a character, she's, you know, married to a really rich woman um, who my Susan is trying to convince her wife Rebecca to fund this birthing center run by the Mantle Twins, or that the Mantle Twins hope to create. She is a woman who does not have children, has not given birth. She's not going to have children. She's not going to give birth, and yet is fixated and sort of obsessed with babies and women in the process of that. I think she's also secretly opportunistic and likes money, of course. But I do think she believes that her drive is to to bring babies into the world. And um, with her, she probably, funny enough, is maybe the furthest away from myself of mm. any character. And the most based on either a combination of people or me, I don't know, sort of creating this this really bizarre mix of character traits that are, I don't really know if I know someone like her. I know of, you know, for example, I know of people who sort of have that fixation with childbirth who have not done it. Or um, I know people who can, can convince themselves that they're doing something altruistic when they're doing something selfish um, I think the quality I probably relate to or bring the most from within me is that sort of desperation to be loved and do something that impacts the world positively. And then that question is, is that altruistic or is that selfish? You know, is there any is there any selfless act? Is there anything that comes from anything other than trying to feel good about yourself or immortalized or like you made an impact on this world before you die? So I certainly relate to that. Um but a lot of the other qualities are, you know, and I, I relate to certain qualities in me being underdeveloped, and <laughs> arrested in development, which I think Susan has. But the rest is, you know, a lot of it's fun. Like, you know, I love to do a Southern accent. <laughs> I love to do comedy in a very off, off way uh, and kind of a way that makes people maybe uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, she, and I love to play characters that you don't know if they're stupid or not. <laughs> and, you know, I think I've met a lot of people in this world like that and or stupid or manipulative. So there were certain pieces of me, but this, I'd say, was actually the furthest from mm. myself. And that was really fun for me because I feel like Lori was a catharsis of something that I, I want to be done with. Yeah. <laughs> and Susan's the... I hope the beginning of a different chapter of getting to, because it's what I thought I was going to do. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a comedian. Mm. I wanted to be on SNL. I wanted to be, I love Lucy and things took a really different track. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've really held out since the deuce to try to find a new chapter. And Susan feels like that to me. What's the production like on dead ringers though? Like what, in terms of what you've been used to, how does this feel? Are you able to, to, operate in the way that you want to and in, in the way that's best for you. Absolutely. Um, sort of to your earlier point about the, you know, over explaining to actors. Um, I think a lot of that just comes down to trust and trusting the actor or not. And I think with this, I, there was so much trust from the directors, from the writers. Um, and it's not that there was never conversations or collaboration or notes, but to feel, you know, I've often been on sets where I feel like people are, you know, I'm almost feel like a toddler waddling around and mm. people are like making sure that you don't do anything that's outside of what they expected or imagined. And they had this really specific image and they are afraid of anything outside of that. Whereas with Dead Ringers, it felt like I was really trusted and all the actors were trusted from the beginning to 
play and see what happens and change things as it went. And then obviously like something that's really important to me and really, you know, I, I helpful, I think for directors to do is let me like when people let me just do a take, do my version of it and show what I, I imagine. Then if we go in and like carve things out and specify things, that's fine. But there's nothing that sort of makes me in my head more than having that whole planned out conversation before because mm. then that creates a fear and like a hyper awareness um yeah so yeah with with dead ringers there was definitely none of that and it was all it was just yeah i felt really trusted and respected and you know people had told me the directors and people involved told me that there was a really different concept of that character before i was the one playing it mm. and so and that's happened to me a lot. People have actually told me that a lot, that I brought something that they didn't imagine and they decided that they liked that. So that's always a huge compliment. Yeah. But because of that, then there was, there wasn't, I didn't feel controlled. I felt trusted and I felt able to sort of find who I thought Susan was. You talked about this a lot, but there might be people that don't know. You were a pioneer in advocating for intimacy coordinators on set like during the deuce and tell me if i get this wrong you were imagining that there w should be this position you didn't even know that there was intimacy coordinators that were actually existing i mean no, really no one did because they weren't used a lot but you went and tried to ask for this imagining that they would have to invent this and they and they were like well, no this exists and we'll get one for this. And then they got intimacy coordinators for all of their shows. And this led to um, this being a thing on all productions that, that have uh, intimacy uh, scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, uh, you know a real pioneering moment. This is something you should be proud of. This was the start of something uh, uh, that needed to happen on production to help actors. And I was wondering if you can think of anything, maybe not on that level of, of help, but things that are happening to actors in an emotional neglect, I would say, uh, or something that, that people just think, well, oh, this is just the way it is. Actors have to get used to this that shouldn't be going on and that should be changed that there should be awareness about i mean it's hard it's a lot more ambiguous that you know for me and i could even think more and more about the things beyond uh what i've already done about the sexual content that could be fixed but a lot of the um lack of kindness or respect in the other emotional areas a lot of it just comes down to people being assholes <laughs> and like they're not, you know, a lot of it comes down to empathy or lack thereof or respect or lack thereof. You know, I think it kind of goes without saying that women have always been treated differently on sets and always will be, <laughs> um, or maybe not, but they have been so far. And I think, you know, we are more quickly vilified, you know, we're more quickly called divas or, um difficult uh because i think there's just always going to be that subconscious unconscious bias and misogyny and you know women were just sort of adam's rib and <laughs> like the, the 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 person serving the male's story um so i think there's just an innate lack of respect you know i've had directors say things to me like you know i once had a director i was supposed to I was working on a film for a long time or here, here's a great example. I did a film. I won't name names, but I did a film. I had to audition for it several times. Uh, I was obviously paid less than my male counter counterpart who was offered the role, who actually had far less credits than I did and had been doing it for less time than I did. I wouldn't say he was a famous person, um, but he was offered the role outright. Uh, I had to audition. He got paid more. I got paid less. Uh, he was flown out, you know, a month in advance to do research and get involved. And I was flown out last minute and had a uh, leftover wig from another actress that looked a little silly. Um, 
And, you know, the director often would talk about me and not to me, whereas they would talk to the male. Um, There, you know, often wasn't necessarily questions to me in the way that there were questions to him. And then there was this one day uh, I was supposed to go home for a period of time because, you know, I had a stretch off and the director decided they wanted to add a shot with me. So I wasn't going to be able to go home. And the female producer was saying to the director in front of me, and it was like Thanksgiving time. It was like a holiday. And he, he was like, you know, we really, she, the female producer was like, we really appreciate that Emily's going to stay for this. Right. And the director said, oh yes, I feel, I'm, I don't want to misquote, but it was like, oh yes, I, uh, I feel so terrible. I've added more shots for her to the movie. Like what a sacrifice she's making wow. <laughs> as if he was doing me, a favor adding more shots versus perhaps you're adding more shots because I'm doing a good job and it will serve your movie. (laughs) Perhaps that's actually beneficial to you. Um, And so that's a really good example of, you know, the ways sex aside that I've been treated like I'm getting a favor for being hired versus a male is doing a favor. How do you fix that? I don't know because that's psychological. Like there's no, there's no rule you can make to change that. Obviously we're trying to get equality with pay and and things like that. That is a, that is a thing that we can physically change. But as far as the perspective on women, I don't know. That's a hard, I don't know how you change that other than teaching men from the time they're (laughs) in kindergarten, how to treat women. I don't know how else you change that. (laughs) And there's also just, an added thing of a lot of these people just hate actors. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. mean, these are people who make movies and make shows. They literally hate actors. Well, I think there's a lot of lack of empathy for actors because it's glamorous and there's a tension in a way that a lot of people probably envy. And it's, you know, like the amount of times I've heard somebody say, you know, when somebody, whatever, goes through something tragic or heartbreaking and people are like, well, they have enough money, so I wouldn't worry about it. And I'm like, I don't know if money really changes, you know, your husband dying. <laughs> I don't know if that really makes up for it. But I think there's a lack of empathy because of the glamour. When meanwhile, not only is there a lot of elements that are unglamorous and traumatizing and really emotionally unhealthy, but it's also a fucking trauma in and of itself to be famous. Like, even the tiny t- tastes of lacking in anonymity I've felt in my life, but, you know, I haven't ever reached that level of fame. Um, seeing people on that level of fame, it is traumatic. It is like an assault on your humanity, even if you wanted it. Um, and of course, there's benefits to it, but there's also a very dark traumatic side to it. And I think unless you have experienced it or you're close to it, it's nearly impossible to have empathy for it. So I think, yes, people hate actors, people envy actors, people assume a lot about actors. I've been in conversations where me and another actor are saying like, you know, acting can be hard because of X, Y, Z and have a person be like, you know, what's hard working construction. (laughs) And it's like, well, sure. That's hard in in a physical way. That's hard on your body, but not only can acting be hard in an emotional way, but I've also had to like get dumped into freezing cold lakes in the middle of winter in Canada and have the, uh, you know, ambulance come because i'm going into like (laughs) shock so there is also physical elements that are also difficult um so i think people see acting and film and television as unnecessary while doing construction is necessary but think about just how much film and television affects the world and our lives and saves lives and informs lives and affects the direction of the world so no i don't think it's unnecessary and uh, you know but yeah, I don't think there's much empathy. You were saying earlier that you hope that this character in Dead Ringers was the start of a new chapter in your career away from this kind of character that you were stuck in, that you were getting a lot of roles uh, for, which is like this uh, objectified, sexually exploited characters. And I was wondering just how hard has this been to try and stick to this transition away from that especially when you did those characters so well (laughs) you know like especially laurie in um the deuce i mean like you have david simon saying stuff like you're one of the great actors that he worked with in all of his shows 
it's kind of like when somebody does something that well, it, it, it makes an indentation in all of these unimaginative uh, Hollywood people. Like they can't imagine, they can't imagine like, because you've done that so well, they can't imagine you can do anything else. Like you must, we have to have another role like that because of how good she, <laughs> instead of just saying <laughs> she could probably do anything, you fucking idiots. Anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so I, what is this like from the from from the headquarters i guess as well mm -hmm. from from the emily mead headquarters like are you mm -hmm. do you have to like rally your team together do you have to like stay on them about this do you have mm -hmm. to like fend off them like saying but look at this this is look how enticing this is you can do this in your sleep again mm -hmm. you know stuff like that yeah it's really hard <laughs> it's been uh you know, the last time I appeared on television was The Deuce, which is going on four years ago. Um, and, you know, there was COVID, which played a huge role. But there's also been a lot of rejection for roles that I want to play that are different than what I've played. And there's been a lot of me having to say no to roles that are, you know, too much in the vein of what I've already played. And, yeah, it requires pissing people off and really betting on myself and believing myself it requires being poor and running out of money because i i can't work and trust me there's sometimes it's really tempting um but i i felt especially after the deuce not only on an emotional level can i not i just have nothing left to give characters like that but i also feel career-wise that if i do one more character like that like that's it <laughs> like my fate is sealed like i i can't i can't afford to do it um, for my long-term career. So I've had to really believe in myself, really hold out, really be um, very clear. And it's been really hard. The only job I've gotten that to me is aligned with what I want to do is Dead Ringers. And that, so that's one job in nearly four years. Um, and I've been just fucking waiting as patiently as possible for it to come out because uh, it's taken a while. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's been really hard. I don't, again, I don't think people, it's it's especially hard because, you know, when you're complaining about, or not complaining necessarily, but when you're upset that you're not working, obviously people in the industry are going to be confused if you say no to something, you know, it has that kind of beggars can't be choosers. But it's, yeah, I want to work, but I want to work on things that I have something to offer. And yes, it can be really fucking frustrating that people don't allow that. Uh, or give you that chance. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes the only power you have is saying no. And then eventually, hopefully you have the power of saying yes. But I've known it was going to be a huge pivot and a huge overhaul to shift this. And I just fucking pray that Dead Ringers at least starts that path forward of like, oh, interesting. She's kind of different and she has all of her clothes on. <laughs> Look at that. And, you know, even if it's on overnight shift, I hope at least somebody sees that and is introduced to a new piece of me and maybe gives me a chance. Emily Mead, thank you so much. Thank you. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.